think I'd like to start things off by congratulating our keynote speaker for not arriving an hour late. Um, <laughs> and for actually sitting and listening to some of, the, um, some of the sessions that have just happened, including uh, Sharon White there. Um, I think it's also fair to say that this year, more than any other, we would have waited a long time because this is a chance to hear um, what the Director General has to say during a crucial, some would say critical moment for the BBC. Charter being renewed at the end of next year. Last week we heard um, Tony Hall's plans for a more open platform BBC. Today, he's going to outline the next chapter in his uh, thoughts and views on the Green Paper. Um, we will have time for questions afterwards, uh, so do prepare them, um, particularly about uh, John Whittingdale's comments last night um, and uh, many more things. So please, Tony, Thank over you. to you. Um, th thank you very much indeed. Uh, I am... Um, it's been really exciting today, actually, for me, from, the big, from this morning's session through the fabulous session on writing, which I thought was so interesting, because in the end, that's at the core of so much of what we do, through all of the other sessions this afternoon, too. Um, th this whole thing about programmes, or, or I guess we've, we've now got to say content, um, because it's the reason we're all here, and that's what I want to talk about this afternoon, which is the BBC uh, and programmes and just stand back a bit and talk a bit about what our role is and about programming about this country from this country. Um, at the moment, uh, we have, and a lot of people have said this, and I agree with them, a really vibrant creative ecology of broadcasting. It's a great national success story, and I might add, it's something that we can all be very, very proud of. We're open to content, programs, services from all around the world. And, and I think that openness, culturally in this country, has been a characteristic for a very long time. Essentially one of the defining features of this country from the age of Elizabeth I. We have a thriving creative industry based in this country and of this country. But the question I want to talk about this afternoon is whether one part of that ecology, our part of that ecology, will continue. Will we carry on making to the degree and the quality we do now? And I'm concerned that in all the arguments and debates, absolutely welcome about the BBC's charter, in a decade's time we look back and say, we missed something really quite crucial, a big trend. And that big trend, to my mind, may well be the slow and recent decline in television production made in Britain and about Britain. Let me declare a strong belief of mine. In this job and also in my last job, I've been a huge believer in the power of Britain's creative industries. I mean, in my own lifetime, I've seen the growth of British music as a huge global success, but also the success of British fashion, literature, design, musicals, architecture, art, video games, and also, of course, broadcasting. When I started at primary school, um, Britain's power was on the classroom wall for all to see. Um, a world with huge areas shaded red. Now Britain's power is great, but different. It's cultural. Some people call that soft power. In a series he's doing for us, one of my favorite historians, Dominic Sambrook, puts it this way. He says, we lost an empire but we gained what he calls an empire of the imagination. And what a very particular and sometimes quirky imagination that empire has. There is, something, there is, for example, something very different from the rest of the world about the way we portray our heroes. We prefer amateur sleuths like Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock or Peter Capaldi's Doctor Who, and globally people love them. The Chinese can't get enough of Sherlock. 77 million of them watched the third series. And Doctor Who's 50th anniversary special was simulcast to 94 countries. And while we're reflecting on heroes, can I just mention one of mine, Sir David Attenborough? Many of David's landmark series for us have reached well over half a billion viewers, 500 million people around the world. And that's quite something. Um, earlier this summer, 
I went to the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds Reserve at Midsmere in Suffolk to spend a night with the Spring Watch team and a fish, Spineless Sai. For those of you who have forgotten Sai, or Simon, as he prefers to be known, he is, or sadly maybe was, a humble stickleback looking for love. Spineless Sai's failure to find a mate was followed by an underwater camera by millions of people. It was another example, to my mind, of our eccentric imagination, as well as the brilliance of the programmes team, who saw one story, nothing happens to a stickleback, and converted into another, what's up with this fish? And by the way, <laughs> there's another twist to the story too. The area around Minsmere now has good quality Wi-Fi, the result of the infrastructure necessary to do live broadcasting. Another, another example of the good we all do in the creative industries. What I want to do today is to set out the case for how the BBC can support the empire of the imagination, the UK's creative industries, through the way we're funded by the license fee, to the proposals we're publishing today on BBC Studios, and our plans to grow our commercial income. Our proposals to open up the BBC will, I believe, help provide opportunities for the whole of the sector. And given this is a time for us to debate the BBC's future, there is no better time to be setting out the choices before us. For, as I've said many times, I believe not in a bigger BBC, but a better BBC, acting in Britain's best interests and as a cornerstone of the British creative economy. Because the choices the choices about our television, choices about the BBC, are in the end choices about our country, our values, and our identity. Let's just remind ourselves about why what we all do in this room matters. The average adult in the UK spends over half of their waking hours engaged in media or communication activities. In a 24-hour period, the average UK adult will sleep for 8 hours and 21 minutes, but they'll also spend 8 hours and 41 minutes engaged in media or communication activities. Um, in between all this, I think we squeeze in some work as well. Naturally, therefore, the mass media has a unique ability to influence huge audiences to shape who we are. Television also reflects who we are as a nation. And it's good that it does, because we're good at television. We make some of the best television in the world. And we have a long, long tradition of making it universally available to everyone. At its best, television inspires and it challenges us like little else. It's how many of us find out what matters, how we expand our horizons. Look what happened, for example, after we broadcast a special day to mark the 750th anniversary of England's first parliament. Awareness of that anniversary shot up overnight from 19% to 34% of adults across the country. And BBC Two's adaptation of Wolf Hall more than doubled public awareness of the novels and helped to increase readership by 40%. Television is also how we strengthen our shared national culture and identity. What would the phrase, a typically British sense of humour, mean without Mr Bean, Patsy and Eddie, or indeed one of Baldrick's cunning plans? What better manifestation is there of the genius of this country's eccentricity than Gogglebox or Britain's Got Talent or the pride, competitiveness and love of cake than the great British Bake Off? Television has shaped our geography. Television transmit transmitter patterns have shaped regional identity over decades. By giving you a peculiar and particular regional or national news programme, and linked you up with a particular group of people. I, for example, grew up in Granada land. And that's even more important today when Britain, the UK, is a nation of nations. How do we reflect the plurality of voices, of opinions, of perspectives across the country? How do we respond to a Britain where we are able to celebrate that which makes us distinct as we also celebrate those things that bind us together, those things that make us one? Television has shaped our memory our memory of childhood from children's broadcasting, in my own case from, it shows my age, Bill and Ben and the Clangers to, uh, well, the Clangers now again. It shaped our memory of national events, 
in 2011, 25 million people watched the royal wedding on the BBC and ITV. And just this year, over 19 million saw some of the BBC's election night coverage. Television tells us what's vital and interesting about the world today. It shapes our conversations, our shared experiences and our arguments. It's how we start conversations online, on social media, starting the kind of national and global debate we wouldn't have dreamt of just a decade ago. Around 40% of all UK Twitter traffic at peak time is related to TV. And last year, the X Factor generated more than 9 million tweets, which is seriously impressive. So it is not a small thing to consider what we show on television. And for the BBC, it is right to do it with a due sense of the impact we can and do have on national life. British audiences love British television. We know that, and we seek to reflect that in what we do. Today, as opposed to a generation ago, the biggest programmes in the UK are all homegrown. So, so far this year, the top five shows are Britain's Got Talent, New Year's Eve, Bake Off, EastEnders and Broadchurch, every one of them British. And incredibly, you have to count through another 3,400 British TV programmes broadcast in 2015 before you get to the first TV programme from outside the UK. That says something really powerful. What our audiences cherish is the range, the richness of British-made television, the things that make us different, that celebrate our distinctive voice. Think of Marvellous, Peaky Blinders, and so much more besides. The creative industries of which television is a crucial part is one of the most productive parts of the UK economy. And by the way, it's so good to see the Creative Industries Federation, not yet a year old, but already with 700 members, looking at how we can together be even more effective in generating economic growth. Working together, the BBC and the wider television community have always been a catalyst for economic growth right across the country. The government's policy of tax credits for high-end productions has attracted significant inward investment into the UK. It's really working. But also, look at the clusters of media activity, now in Salford, Glasgow, Cardiff, Bristol, and how that's raised local pride and economic activity. We are setting up a centre for digital innovation in Faisley Street in Birmingham. So our debate today about British content should not just be about television formats, but expand to include new digital ideas, gaming and, most exciting of all, new ideas we can't even begin to imagine this afternoon. Investment in the creative industries spread far and wide. Behind every star, there's a skilled production team. Behind every production team, there's an array of engineers, editors, camera teams, runners, and behind them, the lens manufacturers, the coders, the set builders, the microphone makers. That, by the way, is why I've put a strong emphasis on apprenticeships at the BBC. Fewer countries are in better creative shape than the UK. And there are not many industries where the UK goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the US. But we do. The big question for us is, can it last? Over the next five to ten years, will it last? In a decade's time, will we still be punching above our weight culturally and economically? And here's where I share with you my concern. Actually, not just my concern, the concern of many in the industry. There is a long-term decline in the amount of UK-originated content. Ofcom's review of public service broadcasting last year identified this as a problem. Over five years, outside sport, Total investment in new, first-run, original television content in the UK fell in real terms from £2.6 billion to £2.4 billion. Over the same period, investment in original British programmes by our public service broadcasters fell by about 15%. Paid TV channels have made up a bit of the difference. Led by Sky, they've made some brilliant programmes, Fortitude, Critical, The Enfield Haunting, these and so many more. But this increased investment made up less than a third of the overall loss. Partly as a result, international revenues for independent producers in the UK fell in 2014, and that's the first time in seven years. So, as the BBC's spending has fallen, overall investment in original British content has also gone down. Whatever the other arguments may be, this, in real life, is what the impact of a smaller BBC looks like.
Will Netflix or Amazon make the range and volume of British programmes to make up the difference? Will they make the British programmes that aren't being made? Well, I will apply a very British test. It hasn't happened yet. Over the past few years, the volume of new UK content broadcast each year outside news and sport has gone down by around 13% or 2,000 hours. In that time, Netflix and Amazon have produced only a few hundred hours of original content between them across the world, almost all of it made in the US, not the UK. I want to be clear, it's really good stuff. House of Cards is amazing. But my point is that these new businesses seem so far unlikely to address the Britishness problem, the Ofcom problem. They are unlikely to address at scale the decline in original content for the UK. And this is a problem for all of us. But I am certain that the BBC also is part of the solution. And can I just say, good for Philippe last night, it's great to hear that he wants to invest in Channel 5 content too. The BBC's job is to discover and invest in the best British creative content and people and connect them with an audience at home and abroad. We want to perform a unique, distinct function in our media ecology. Great British content, a trusted guide for everyone. We are the largest single investor in British creative ideas and talent. The license fee accounts for around 20% of television revenues, but around 40% of the investment in original British programmes. Each year, we invest well over £2 billion of license fee income directly into the UK creative sector. Around half of that money is invested outside of the BBC, with £450 million in small creative businesses. And here's the simple truth, which I'm saying not for political reasons, but just because it's a truism and hard to avoid. Ender's analysis summed it up very well last week. For every pound cut in the BBC television funding, first-run UK content investment goes down by at least 49 pence. So the market would replace only half of lost license fee investment. And this raw fact means we have to organize ourselves better in order to meet the challenge of British content in a time of greater and greater competition. So it's obvious to me, the first thing we need is a secure BBC. And that starts with our funding settlement, the budget agreement we have with the Chancellor and Secretary of State delivers that, though it will not be without its challenges and painful choices. And as I said last week, inevitably, we will have to reduce or close some services. It's all, it's tough. But all that said, we welcome the government's commitment to stick to the agreement. Delivering the agreement, though, means not fragmenting the license fee through top slicing. It's not a good idea in principle or in practice, because it substitutes public money for private money. It's allocated by committees rather than commissioners. It's subject to lobbying rather than audiences. And it weakens accountability and transparency. So let me make it clear for the record that any suggestion of top slicing or reduction in our ability to make commercial returns would be seen by us as reopening the agreement. By itself, though, the agreement won't restore the fall in original British content, let alone allow it to grow. That's why we think the government's option for a household fee merits further consideration, because it could bring new investment and safeguard the BBC support for the creative economy for the long term. Of course, it's not all about money, and we've heard a lot about culture this afternoon. It's also about the environment in which we work, the richness of the culture that we create. That's something the amazing talent we have in the industry keep talking to me about. And I want the BBC in the next decade to be a magnet for creativity, the place people come to to make brilliant programmes, programmes of distinction, for producers, directors, writers, artists to have the creative freedom to do things they would find it harder to do elsewhere. We want to employ the best people with the best ideas doing their best work, to get great teams to work together, to help the next generation of talent find their voice. Oscar-winning directors such as Danny Boyle and Tom Hooper or global acting stars like Sir Ken Branagh, Eddie Redmayne, Kerry Mulligan, all had early breaks backed by the BBC. And that's why, for me, Reforming the BBC to be a leaner, simpler organisation, a more creative organisation, a process I began in July, is so important. 
That's why I also want to open the BBC to become even more Britain's creative partner, to become a platform for this country's incredible talent. An open BBC for the internet age will be a BBC that is truly open to partnership. And that means, I hope, us all working together much more closely. We want to be the best commissioners and the best partners. We want to work with the best independent producers and help new companies thrive. I spoke last week about some of our proposals to open up the BBC. The Ideas Service, bringing together what the BBC does across arts, culture, science, history and ideas, alongside the work done by some of our other great institutions in this country. That's why, with our partners in music, we propose a new discovery service to showcase the best in music today and be a champion for new British music on new platforms as well as traditional ones. That's why, for example, we want to put the iPlayer at the service of the sector. We want to explore new opportunities to bring together UK original content to help industry and audiences alike. And we need to guarantee that the British public can continue to access public service content on platforms they are using, whatever they are in the future. So we need policymakers to modernize the regulatory framework around us. Today, audiences can find public service channels easily on traditional, well, mostly easily, on traditional TV platforms. We need to ensure public service broadcasting is as easy to find on future platforms as it is now. But what we need to do in the UK is only part of the story. British values and British identity have a special place in the world, and this country's media has a vital role in building the UK's influence. I was struck by a recent ranking by Portland Communications of different countries' soft power. No one who spent any time abroad would be surprised, I think, to see the UK in first place. And the report cites Britain's creative industries as a key part of the impact we have. What is it going to require to be successful in the global market, to continue that success? A market I need remind no one in this room that is more competitive, more expensive, more digital, more global than ever. The first thing we must have, quite obviously, the thing that everyone wants is world-beating programmes. To meet the expectations of audiences in the UK, we must all think globally. So the BBC needs to be able to commission the best programmes from wherever they come, from inside the corporation and outside, from a brilliant independent production sector and from big studios. We rely on the independent sector for some of our best-loved programmes, from Happy Valley to Poldark. And our partners come in all shapes and sizes. We value their partnership, we laud their entrepreneurship, and we welcome their ingenuity. But the market has changed. At the top end, there are big, mature companies reaping the rewards of global success. But for some smaller companies, business remains difficult in a tough economic environment and we want to help, to add to some of the things we're already doing. We want to explore what more we can do to support smaller and new companies to manage creative risk and business risk. If we feel small companies have real creative potential or they're operating in genres which need more support, we want to offer that support. I also want us to work with partners to provide additional business expertise from outside the BBC. But we also need to keep the BBC itself as one of the world's great programme makers, able to compete on the global stage. Look at some of the recent deals to see the scale of the issue. Netflix securing the rights to make the biopic The Crown, 100 million pounds apparently, and Amazon signed the Top Gear team for a reported 160 million pounds. The costs of the best content are growing. So if we want to continue to create great programs and experiences for audiences, we need to be able to choose the best ideas from both indies and in-house. But for that to be a real choice, we have to have a thriving in-house team. And that's what motivates our proposals to create BBC Studios. And it brings a second benefit. For in-house shows, we own the rights to that intellectual property. That means that all of the commercial returns, all of them, is put back into the BBC. And that means we can invest more in programmes. It matters we have teams producing big global hits, like Doctor Who, Strictly and Top Gear. 
an extraordinary range of specialist programs too. There isn't another production team in the world that could deliver the strength of science content on show this week on the BBC. Owning intellectual property also allows the BBC to innovate too. We couldn't have launched iPlayer or BBC Store next month without that critical mass of programmes made by the BBC as a starting point. And it will continue to be vital as we develop new platforms and services. So the creation of BBC Studios is an essential part of our strategy. BBC Studios will have the values and the quality of the BBC, a mission to inspire audiences at home and around the world with bold British originality and creativity. It will find and nurture the next generation of British on-screen and backstage talent in drama, comedy, science, natural history and more. It will be distinctive in the market. It will have range and specialism, making the full range of genres and not just those with the most commercial appeal and it will operate across the UK. It will ensure the full value of BBC-made content is returned to the licence fee payer. But please note, it will be vital, it will stimulate the sector, but it will not be dominant. There must be a level playing field and we'll, we will ensure there is. We estimate it will have a share of under 15% of the UK production market and it will operate at arm's length. There will be no cross-subsidy from the licence fee and it will be stringently and independently regulated. Today, we're publishing a paper setting out much more detail on the BBC Studios proposals, which we hope will answer some of the questions that have been raised and address some of the concerns. And the Trust will be consulting on all this too as part of the charter process. There are many questions, details, differences of opinion to be worked through, and I want, and the teams want, to work with you all to get these proposals right. We've had some really productive conversations with people in this room and outside, and I want to keep those discussions going. Finally, in today's financial climate, everybody is being asked to deliver more for less. So we too need to have a commercial strategy where BBC Worldwide delivers as much as possible back into the public service programmes. It's already what we do. It's what's made BBC Worldwide so successful. Let's not forget that we've built a world-class and growing media business. It has a £1 billion a year turnover, and that gave the BBC a record return of £226 million last year. Critically, this has not only supported the BBC, but also the hundreds of independents who partner with Worldwide in production and distribution. And this is not just a financial story. Worldwide is instrumental in showcasing UK content across the globe. Think of the recent and highly successful launch of the UK premium drama channel, BBC First, in Australia. Or our unique showcase event in Liverpool, great city, which attracts hundreds of buyers across the world. In a global market, this benefits the BBC, but also our partners and stimulates demand across the wider UK industry. However, we know, we recognise, we must keep doing more. Over the last couple of years, BBC Worldwide has, in, has been investing even more in content. More than 70% of the funding of BBC One's natural history landmark, Life Story, was commercial. And the licence fee paid for less than half the budget of some of our biggest dramas last year. Our biggest upcoming dramas, War and Peace, Dickensian, are all dependent on co-production deals and investment involving BBC Worldwide. That puts more money on screen for the British public and helps take the best British content to global audiences. But this model only works if BBC Worldwide is thriving. It is an indivisible part of the BBC. It is because of its special relationship with the BBC that it has scale. Because of this, that it takes British creativity to the world. Because of this, that it brings the benefits of globalisation back to the UK. Or to look at it through another lens. Without BBC Worldwide, the licence fee would have to be £10 higher. That's why any proposal to carve out BBC Worldwide from the BBC doesn't make economic sense. While every major global player, as we've heard today, is creating a more integrated system, 
it would make no sense for us to go the other way and break up a system that is delivering returns that are essential to support public service programming. It would make it harder for the BBC to diversify its revenue still further. And it would diminish one of the best shop windows to the world for British talent and program makers, whether at the BBC or from independence. Over the next few years, we intend to work with global partners to grow worldwide further, taking advantage of the demand for British programming and new digital opportunities. Following on from our AMC partnership in the US, we've just signed a new joint venture with Sony Multiscreen Media to launch a BBC Earth channel to India. And we'll begin to try out businesses that go direct to the public. Next year, we're launching a new OTT video service in America, offering BBC fans programmes they wouldn't otherwise get, showcasing British actors, our programme makers, and celebrating our culture. Overall, we think our plans will increase commercial returns from worldwide to the BBC to £1.2 billion over the next five years, more than 15% higher than, than the returns of the previous five years. So that's the worldwide ambition. We need to raise commercial income to supplement the licence fee so we can invest as much as possible in content for UK audiences. And to pick up a phrase from Amanda Yanucci's brilliant McTaggart lecture, let's not be icky and modest about making money. Without that income, we can't continue what we already do for the UK in drama and natural history, which means UK audiences would find themselves the poorer. We will strengthen the global voice of the UK. We'll give our country's talent and creativity a global stage, find the next generation, help them make their leap to global stardom. The next Benedict Cumberbatch, James Corden or Adele. In this room, there is an extraordinary array of talent and every one of you has helped make Britain the creative powerhouse it is today. Because of you, we have built the UK to become one of the most creatively successful and influential countries in the world. And that has made Britain economically more successful too. That has made our culture and our democracy stronger. And we have to keep working at it and working at it all over again. The Britishness of British broadcasting matters. It isn't isolationist or backward looking to say that. The Britishness of British broadcasting is under challenge. It's obvious and measurable. The Britishness of British broadcasting isn't something that just happens. Global markets will take, won't take care of it. We have to. Never, I think, in all our collective history and experiences has there ever been a technological challenge as bracing but also as exciting as this one, as bracing as the challenges and the opportunities posed by the internet and globalization. But the test for us all is this. How does this conference look in 10 years? Will we have sufficiently understood the challenges posed by the global market and responded in a way that improves the creative industries and serves the British public better? Or will we prove to have been short term and narrow in our concerns, looking in the rear view mirror or worrying about the problems of 2015, not the issues of 2025? I want to see a British television ecology in the next decade that is even better than it is today, that supports a high level of investment in a wide range of high quality programs and new digital content, homegrown for British audiences, that keeps Britain punching above its weight around the world, and that keeps making programs that we all love, enjoy and watch together. Thank you very much. I would like to start by taking you back to that day in yep. July when the Secretary of State called you and yep. said, I'm going to take £700 million from mm. your budget. Do you think you played it right over the next few days? Could you not have gone public there and then or over the next few days before you reached the agreement on Friday? Well, um, let me say a number of things. One is that um, I, this is not, a, and I've made this clear everywhere I've gone, this is a process that should not, I mean, it just is not the right process for determining uh, something as important as the future financial stability of the BBC. It just ain't. So let's just but set that to one side. I made it absolutely clear um, when I was rung up by the Secretary of State what a £700 million impost on the BBC from 2017 would mean. Any of you who have read the annual report know that you're not talking about salami slices there, you're talking about big, meaty cuts in what we would do. And that's what we would have had to have done. Um, we then had a series of meetings, actually two meetings, uh, one with the Chancellor and the Secretary of State and the uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, when I outlined what it would mean 
uh, left them in no doubt about that, and also um, what you would have to do, the things you'd have to look at to ameliorate what they were doing. Um, and then on Friday, the Chancellor said, come in and see me, and we went through a, a list of things. So, you know, what we had to weigh then was, we had one, uh, a license fee uh, aligned with CPI, that's something which I feel is really important. Uh, phasing of the over 75s uh, out by a couple of years, uh, the Chancellor understood the pressure on, on our finances. An end to the top slicing of 150 million uh, pounds a year for broadband rollout, which I just think is, is daft, and every time we talk to anyone about it, people say, what's that doing from the license fee? Um, uh, uh, you know, plus, we also got uh, the policy would come to us to sort out from um, uh, the year 2000 and modernization of the license fee uh, uh, within a year. Those are big things to have got. Now, then the choice is, do you think if you just said at the end of that session, and we'd been teams of people working out what that meant, calculating what it meant, that is a better deal than the one in 2010, by a long chalk, if you just walked off and said, okay, that's it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, go public and, and, uh, uh, and fight this out in public, does anybody really think after a year, a year and a half of battling away, you'd get a better deal than that? I certainly don't. Well, and and that was the, that's the judgment Mm. I and the trust had to make uh, on that Friday afternoon uh, uh, and over that weekend. And my judgment was, actually, we've won an awful lot. We've won the um, uh, ability to reform the policy of the over 75s. I mean, as well as actually asking people to voluntarily uh, 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 give their money, but also from, 20, from, the, from after the election. Uh, those were things we should uh, bag and, uh, 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 and ensure that they delivered against. You had to make it then because they were going to announce it on Monday. Uh, they were going to announce it on the, on the budget on the and, then, um, and then it all came out very fast because Chris Bryant asked, a, uh, urgent asked a, an urgent question and so I think we had about an hour and 15 minutes if I recall to, um, uh, to you know, get everything ready to tell the staff and others about what was going on. You talked in your speech about um, hoping that they stick to the agreement. Mm. Did you get a commitment from them yes. with the inflation yes. that the licence fee would be a minimum yes. of 145.50? Yes. You got a commitment? Yes, barring uh, one thing, which is if there is some major change in the scope or scale of the BBC. Major change. But no, that, that commitment was there <coughs> from the Chancellor and it was quite clear and I believe it. And so did they spell out what a major change would look like? Or are you clear? I'm clear what a major change would look like, and I think we all kind of know what a major change would look like. Um, uh, I mean, it's not moving the news uh, from 10 o'clock, it's something like uh, stop doing local radio or something like that, uh, and I understand that. But is that why uh, the Secretary of State last night talked about the sort of aggressive reaction to the Green Paper, which I, maybe he meant the letter that was signed in the Telegraph? Is that why your reaction to that Green Paper was a bit more aggressive than it had been to the deal? We were absolutely clear that the agreement we came to with the Chancellor, leave the process aside, because I think it's the wrong process and I don't like it, but leave that aside, that that was it. And if you want to come back and start saying, well, actually, we'll have a look at, it. we'll take a bit more money from the BBC here, we'll take a bit, that's just not on, you know? That deal is tough. Um, uh, it, it's going to require some hard choices. I'm going to take my time working out what those are. That, that's what I owe the staff as well as our audiences. So it's tough. But, you know, there was all sorts of stuff in the press that weekend. I mean, all the usual speculation that there, there, there is. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt we had to say very clearly why the BBC matters. And actually, you know, the B we all know the BBC matters. And loads of people have been saying to me, both since then, uh, uh, since then and after, how much the BBC matters to them. And I think it's very good those people are coming out and saying, you know, the BBC matters, it does things, as if you could have heard Brian, Brian was brilliant there, talking about what the BBC offers in terms of science, which no other person, no other broadcaster rather, would do. And I think it's important that those things are said. Mm. As you brought up the News at 10 issue, yes. did that surprise you? Stupid, are you going it? to move it? It was stupid. Yeah, yeah well, of me, I mean, to bring it up. Um, I had, <laughs> I... Do you, do you think John Whittingdale was stupid to have mentioned it? <laughs> no, 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 John Whittingdale can, he's a second to say, he's what he wants. I mean, look, um, Jane was reminding us this morning in, 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 uh, in her session, which I, again I say I thought was an absolutely fabulous session, um, just how it all came about and, and, uh, and how it has allowed drama on BBC One and BBC One uh, to, um, to be bolder, to run dramas that they couldn't have otherwise done. You know, that was a major, major change. Um, and also remember that at that point, um, 
ITV have decided that um, the news at 10 should be uh, sometimes at 10, sometimes at 10.30, but more at 10.30, I think. I, I mean, others will remember more, more precisely, which meant that Greg came out, Greg Dyke came out with the, the, fr the phrase which he loved and is very Greg, you know, the news at when. So, you know, we were, we were, we were, we were, we were not sort of saying, right, we'll go head to head with news at 10. We were moving into what was, you know, a semi vacant lot. So that's really important. Listen, for my mind, um, and it's what I said when the green paper comes out, I mean, the most important voice here you know, is the audiences. The audiences at 10 o'clock for our news are really, really strong. It works, uh, and I don't quite see why you therefore want to play around with that. But where I think the process that the Green Paper has set going is absolutely right, and John goes on about this and he's right to, it's really important for us to demonstrate that we're distinctive, uh, that we're doing things that, you know, that, that show, that have a kind of BBC quality to them. So, if you look at, uh, I spent uh, some time last week with Charlotte Moore, BBC One controller and her team, and I, I had a great time. I think when you see the thing, her ideas that are coming up over the autumn and into the winter, you'll say, this is a, this is a BBC One. But he was one. talking it really specifically about scheduling, though, Tony, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was just, wasn't just, what because it wasn't, it wasn't no, the no, distinctiveness what, 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 of the news. It was what, what, why what, put it against a rival. Uh, so will what, you move, what, what would you I, move News no. at 10 because ITV don't want you no, to? No, because, because actually the, 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 uh, the, the audiences are well served there. The audiences for the 10 o'clock news are extremely good, as indeed they are for the 6 to 7 o'clock uh, slot um, as, as, as well. What I'm answering is, I, what, what I'm, I'm trying to ask, maybe, what John Whittington is also is clear about, and these are the sort of things, the reason he says that, I think, is because he's interested in the distinctiveness of BBC One. And he's right to be concerned about the distinctiveness of BBC One. I believe in it, Charlotte does. And I think, you know, a channel which, you know, uh, shows the inspector calls brilliant on Sunday night, earlier had done, gone off live to Monterey Bay to uh, watch otters and, and, and whales, had also done an extraordinarily live half hour from our correspondence on the refugee crisis and has a whole lot of great programmes coming up over the autumn and the winter. This is a BBC One in good shape and it's being distinctive. But, you know, we've got to keep asking ourselves, are we doing what licence fee pairs and the way we're funded, mm. uh, are we doing the things that we should be doing, the originality, the boldness, the creativity that we should be uh, using the licence fee to, to boost? Is it right to put the voice against X Factor, for example, though? Um, I believe in the voice. Um, I think if you, I go back actually to a programme I saw, I think sometime uh, over the winter period by Michael Gray talking about um, the competitive schedule on Saturday evening for entertainment that's always been a feature of BBC and ITV. Look, my view is audiences are well served by an ecology, and we've talked a lot today, it's interesting how, many, as, and, and American people as well, have talked about the successful broadcasting ecology in this country. You've got the BBC, you've got ITV, they, 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 they compete. I think that's really good for all of us. And by the way, you've then got Channel 4 and you've got Channel 5 offering more into that creative mm. ecology and Sky doing stuff too. You know, one of the things coming back into this world after uh, 12 years out of it, uh, when I was on Channel 4 board, but you know, out of the executive bit, is this is, you know, we are amazingly lucky in this mm. country. And, and although we might have, you know, ding-dongs with X and Y and all that sort of stuff, actually, Broadly, we've got something here which really works, and how do we conserve that, preserve it, but also we, we respond to all the threats mm. that we, we know they're out there, or opportunities, as I should call them. You, you said again today that cuts to services would be inevitable, um, and I know you're making an announcement after, I think, October the 8th, mm. but can you share with us what you're going to do less of and which areas you feel that you can make those? No, because I'll share that with I'll, I'll share that as we, as we uh, you know lovingly put it um, with the, with the staff first. Look, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a clear. I mean, this is really boring for you, but I, I, I'll talk about. It. I mean, there's two processes, right? One is um, because of the decline um, in um, television uh, 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 ownership of television sets, um, television penetration. There we are, television sets. Um, we have to. Um, uh, uh, lose 150 million pounds on our budget by uh, by the end of march uh, 2017 and what i'll say by christmas is how we do that and the first bit of it and you know i do not want to lose a pound of money from over from programs when i'm not satisfied that we've got the simplest possible management structure the lightest possible overheads you know, that we really are, and this is going to take more than just till Christmas to do this, I need to be absolutely convinced about that before I say, and by the way, we're going to have to take some money from X or Y or Z. 
There is then a process after that where um, I'm basically going to go back and look at every pound we spend and see where we can reprioritize to live within the uh, funding settlement that we've got uh, up to uh, 2021. But be clear, the first, uh, uh, you know, the first year or so of that, I'm going to take my time on working that through. I, again, I go back, I, I'm, I don't like just simply saying we're going to hack here, hack there. I'd rather make choices based on data and based on evidence of audiences and also based on talking to people who are running these areas uh, and what they can tell me. Will the creation of BBC Studios actually save you money? And if so, how much? Um, I can't tell you uh, how much. I mean, that's uh, um, what Peter Salmon and I will be talking about uh, over the next is, is bit. But let me tell you one thing. In terms, I think there's two important things about BBC Studios. One is, um, and it came out of the session on, on, on students, I think really clearly, leadership. Leadership is really important. And I think the separate leadership of BBC Studios is really important. Um, I think lighter management is really important. Creative management is, is, is really important. And then I think it's a thing which a number of people have mentioned in some sessions. It's culture. And I, I, let me praise Peter. Peter has done a brilliant job uh, in uh, Salford. You know, when you walk in there, you feel this is an energised culture. It feels really, really good to me every time I've been there, and I, uh, uh, and, and I love it. And I think the culture is really... I mean, it is. The, the session, uh, the writer's session, I find it disturbing, actually, after the, the, the um, time I spent, uh, uh, you know, in theatre, in opera and ballet, um, that people don't talk, that the writer doesn't mm. talk to X or the, the, this person doesn't talk to Y. I mean, you know, what, what, what I love about the, the industry we're in are, are teams and, and the way that teams operate. And I think Peter's, that for me is something, Peter, I know will rise to that challenge because he's great at that. That really, really matters a lot. So it's not about saving money, studios. I it is about, um, we will save money wherever we can. Let's be clear about that. You know, and I don't want to avoid that question. This is about future of the intellectual property for the BBC, um, and it's for ensuring that not only do we, you know, I, I'm, you know, I believe profoundly in the BBC as a as a as a, as a, um, uh, a public service pr uh, program maker, not a publisher broadcaster, absolutely not. But the thing we've got to answer to people out there is how we also make sure it's a level playing, playing field, because I I know that I also want us to support and enjoy the vibrancy of the independent sector. Okay, now we've got some time for questions. Please, um, we don't have very long, and I am very keen that you ask questions. So please, name, mm. title, no statements of what your view is. We have very little time with the Director General. Um, first, this man there, and then, yep, John, and then Catherine. Oh, have you got, who's got the thing? Hi, Conrad Rover, Prospero Strategy. Um, the BBC already uh, competes with social media platforms for user time, increasingly they might start competing with BBC actually as service providers. Facebook's a good example of this. One of the distinctive features of social media is that services are personalized and they involve setting up a profile that enables the service to provide the, the uh, content that they think will be interesting to the user. Why has it taken the BBC so long to achieve so little in terms of sort of BBC membership, if you like? Do you think it's important, and do you think the BBC will crack this? I'm sorry, I can't see where you are. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Oh, fantastic. Good. Um, I, I, I think uh, we have taken... Uh, I think we're, we're too slow in using data. Um, I, I, if that's the brunt of what you're saying, then I would agree with you. I've said that. I think Rona Fairhead has also said that, actually. And I think the opportunity for us... Um, if, you were, if you give us your data about your preferences and da 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 we um, won't use it to sell you anything. You know, we will use that to show you the broad range of programming that is available on the BBC and other, and other content as well. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us um, to act on behalf of the people who pay for us. And if that's the implication of what you're saying, uh, I agree. Um, and I'm really keen. I mean, we've got a project called My BBC, which is exactly this. And I'm really keen that um, you know we steam ahead with that full speed. Because the other thing, the other thing we know about license fee payers and our audiences is that um, when they see the broad range of programming that's available to them, you, you know, the, the, the people really appreciate that. And all the scores about why we like the BBC, so just start zooming upwards. 
and finding your way around the mass of stuff we've already got and the library is really important. So I was really pleased when Cassian, uh, 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 BBC4, um, the other week did a, a pop art season for the week. And uh, this is not the data stuff, but then suddenly you saw on that central band on the, I, on the iPlayer, not only the programs we're doing that week, but also documentaries from the archive as well. Now, you know, when you begin to, to latch into people's preferences and tastes and say, actually, we can make this stuff which is already there available to you, I think that could be very, very powerful. So it's something I, re I really want us to um, excel at. I'm getting close to the, the time. So can I have two questions? Um, and then we'll get an answer, but we might be running out of time. So John and then, uh, yeah. OK, uh, I'll, I'll be quick. I've got about four pages of questions, but I'll just use one. Um, <laughs> just one. Uh, but for what I'm quite pleased to say, for once, this isn't my conspiracy theory. It's actually what Stuart Purvis put to Sharon in the previous session about why the Secretary of State may have called for a review of the terms of trade mm. and that the, maybe, this may be in the interest of the BBC who are seeking What's so the question, John? further, further the question? I'm nearly there, further IP uh, for your global ambitions. Can you confirm that the BBC is not seeking the removal of the terms of trade, nor will it be seeking to do that in the review? Um, can I just correct something you said this morning, which is we haven't been lobbying. Uh, the thing I believe in and absolutely want to work with you and others on is BBC Studios. That's top of my mind. That's what I want to achieve for all the reasons I outlined in my speech. Hi, Catherine Rushton from the Daily Mail. Um, one of the really valuable and oh, hello. There you are. Yes. Hi. <laughs> one of the really valuable and important things about the BBC is its impartiality. Yeah. Now, arguably, that has come under pressure in recent months because your creative director has admitted intervening on three different occasions in your coverage of Kids Company. It's also emerged that he um, commissioned, presented, and we believe was paid for presenting a program, an Imagine what? episode about a Kids Company. You've been asked to open an investigation by MPs. Have you done so? And if not, why not? Um, uh, on the programme, which was before my time, uh, uh, Alan Yentor made it absolutely clear uh, he had an interest in kids company. We looked at it um, either at the time or certainly I have looked at it since then and I'm satisfied that that uh, was a proper declaration. I've said endlessly, but I'll ha happily uh, repeat, um, the BBC led on the, the reporting of Kids' Company. The BBC were the people who actually, and Newsnight in particular, who actually led on investigating and on revealing things about the Kids' Company. That's not an, that's not a, an, an, an organisation that is cowed by anybody. That's an, that's, that's, that's an organisation which absolutely puts its impartiality at its core, even when it's reporting on members of, uh, of, the, of the team. I'm sorry. It's a huge testament to your journalist, but there's still a question of propriety. I, you know, all our journalists come under pressure from all sorts of people. Good Lord, I could tell you a list of the people who ring up uh, 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 and complain about programmes. The test I've got is, is the output are the things that are then delivered on air, actually impartial and done without fear or favour. I have no shadow of doubt about that. That thing is blinking at me, but can we have... Uh, we've got time for two more, haven't we? We're not... Yeah. I mean, we're so again, much earlier than we tomorrow. were yesterday. So that we, at least we can eat before nine. So, so um, hang on, you need, to, you need to put the choice. A drink or two more questions? Oh, go on, two... Oh, OK, yes, all right. A drink, a drink or two more questions? Two more questions. Questions, go on. This, yep, yeah, and, and I don't know, just watch anyone else. Hello, Tony. Nick Toon from Time Warner. Um, first of all, congratulations on the speech, Tony. It was a really great articulation of just why everybody in this room, from wherever they come from in the ecology, wants to see a strong and healthy BBC Thank emerge you. from this process. And my question is about um, the BBC's commercial ambitions. You talked a good deal in the speech about your ambitions for BBC Worldwide. Can you just clarify, was that primarily you making the case for retention of BBC Worldwide within the BBC, or are you arguing that BBC Worldwide needs to be given a greater degree of commercial freedom than it currently enjoys, and if so, what are those additional freedoms? Um, Nick, uh, thanks for the question. No, I am, I'm absolutely arguing for the indivisibility, I thought I wouldn't be able to say that word, uh, but I can, of uh, BBC Worldwide and the, and the BBC. Um, I mean, the, you know, there were, there were ideas in the past of severing that link. You know, my profound belief uh, is it's, we've got to work closely together with proper you know, um, uh, with space, because it's a commercial entity, the rest of the BBC is a public service, but that our audiences, our programme makers, benefit from that, uh, from that combination. So this is about ensuring that uh, the BBC remains um, public service and worldwide together.
Was there another question over here? Or have I... Okay, that man there then. Hi, uh, Hugh Jones, S4C. Um, Tony, the bit in the uh, new document about partnerships is a little bit apologetic um, and Steve has suggest could do better. As, is, um, as Mark Thompson said back in 2003, I think, it was much the same uh, speech. Um, we've got a great story to tell about yeah. the partnership with the BBC in recent years, putting S4C programmes on iPlayer, for example. But why is it, do you think, that is there something in the BBC's DNA which makes it uh, able to deliver fantastic content internally, but makes working with yeah. other partners a little bit more difficult. Yeah, uh, this isn't Mark Thompson's speech, I promise you that. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been working on it myself. You've really um, upset him. Um, I don't, <laughs> I, I think organisations, uh, all organisations talk about partnership and find it actually quite difficult. Because in truth, partnership is difficult. What I'm saying is, and it's partly, it's quite personal actually, because having spent a lot of time outside and seeing the BBC from the outside, so I'm a kind of insider outsider, or an outsider inside, if you see what I mean, and I've, I feel that very strongly. I can see the brilliance of the BBC and the ambition that the, the, the BBC has had. Also, when I was working on LOCOG uh, during the um, Olympic Games, you saw what people coming together um, uh, in real partnership could achieve. And, and almost the most wonderful thing for me about the Games, apart from the Games themselves, was the fact that people started talking to each other. And now you can see those partnerships happening all over the place in the creative sector, in the arts particular uh, uh, culture. And that's what I think it's the culture change I want to bring about in the BBC. And by the way, I can see it, and I talk to people, and I can see how it can happen. Um, and, uh, but, you know, w one of the things we've got to do is to make sure that what I want and what I think the team want and what I see people wanting and what you would want doesn't get blocked further down by um, stuff, which is, <laughs> to use a technical term, and which is why uh, I attach a huge amount of importance to simplifying the organisation, to getting the, 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 the management structure right so that managers do what I really believe managers must do, which is enable things to happen. You know, it's fascinating listening to all three and how they manage a federation. You know, we are there to be creative enablers and have ambition. And I just think sharing um, iPlayers we are doing with you, but with others too, is one way in which we can aggregate pe uh, people who think like us, feel like us, um, and therefore do more. And I think in the time we're in of finances being more and more restricted, ambition is important and ambition to do more is important. Tony, thank you. I, just one more thing I wanted to ask, a final question. That last night, somebody t described you as a brilliant peacetime general at a time of war. Are you up for the fight for the next 18 months? Yeah, absolutely. And it is uh, going to be a battle. Listen, this is, this is um, um, I'm just trying to work that one out. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, I thought it was a little bit in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do like parades. <laughs> I, 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 this, uh, not very good on a horse. Um, <laughs> but no, no, no. I, look, the, the reason when um, Chris Patton said to me, will you come back to the BBC? The reason, I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew exactly. I mean, I was leaving somewhere I loved. You know, the Royal Opera House, I loved that place. Opera and ballet, theatre, just smelling backstage and then that sort of sense of excitement when the tabs go up and all that. It's brilliant. But I'm only, I've only come back for one reason. It's because I believe in this place. And I really believe in being ambitious about this place. Um, uh, I mean, the BBC, not this place. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and that's what I want to do. And I will do. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you.